Hello, everybody. I wonder if you can see this. This is a flower which I picked from the garden today. It's a bluet flower. Um, and it's a bit of a symbol of memory, a bit like the poppy to the French. And it's this time of the year in May that thousands of these flowers grow along uh, the Chemin du Dam. Um, the bluet is associated also with the conscripted soldiers, young conscripts, who came from the nine, 1895 class, who arrived to take part in the Nivelle Offensive in April 1917. Um, it also symbolises um, the horizon blue uniform that many of these young men wore. So it's, it's a mem to, to us in the UK, this is the cornflower. I'd like to think these were seeds are picked in France on one of the many visits I've taken to the Chemin de Dam region, but sadly not, came from a packet. Okay, so today I want to talk about the, um, the end battle of uh, May 1918. The British were here, of course, in 1914. But it's the 1918 variation, iteration that I would like to discuss today. Um, this is a recent postcard I've uh, managed to acquire from eBay in the last two or three months. Uh, so these souvenirs and associations with um, the end battle turn up on a regular basis. Um, what's special about this one? is it's a postcard that comes from a drawing that's found in the regimental history of the Queen Elizabeth um, Guard Grenadier Regiment, number three, who took part in the attack on the Aisne in May 1917, on the 27th of May. They attacked just west of um, the Bois de Butts, which I'll, I'll discuss later on. As you can see, there were quite a number of prisoners of war in this photograph, many of them, sorry, in this drawing, still wearing their gas masks. Um, my grandfather, seen here in this photograph, could have been one of these prisoners. He was taken prisoner in the 50th Division on the 27th of May, probably early in the morning. He was in the 8th Durham Light Infantry, um, part of the 50th Division along with my great uncle, also in the 50th Division. You can see a DLI cap badge here. He never actually served abroad in the DLI. He served in a number of battalions of the Northumberland Fusiliers, and he was taken prisoner on the 27th of May at pont de -Ver, um, where by mid-morning, the Grand Grenadier Regiment man had managed to advance across the Aisne River. This is a roll call from his battalion of officers um, in April 1918. If we look down the right-hand column, you may be able to make out the fact that the vast majority of these men actually joined in April 1918. Um, so they didn't really know each other, a lot of them, um, and it shows you the tremendous uh, turnover that had taken place in many of the divisions that were to serve on the end. Here we have somewhere in the region of 25 officers joining out of probably no more than uh, low 30s. Um, they had been smashed on the Somme in March and again on the lease in April 1918. Um, and this particular battalion was not out of the ordinary. Uh, many of the battalions of the divisions that served on the AIM would have suffered similar numbers of car uh, casualties. Unit identity would have been difficult to achieve under these circumstances when they all arrived uh, to the AIM region uh, during mid 
to late April 1918. Right, I would now like to outline what I intend to discuss today with regard to the Ain Battle of 1918. So first of all, the first thing I would like to kind of consider is the nature of the battle and how it was fought. Certainly, why was the offensive launched by the German army in May such an astonishing tactical success uh, that caused Major General Yub Asim to state in his 1972 history, the Battle of Europe in 1918, that it was the essence of Blitzkrieg. And finally, the third point I'd like to consider, how this particular battle breaks many of the stereotypical uh, views of fighting on the Western Front during the Great War and how it breaks some of its associated myths. Where was the aim? We can see from this, this map the general location of the AIM battlefield of 1918, roughly 66 miles northwest of Paris and much further south of the sector that's traditionally associated with uh, the British Army. It's not the Somme, it's not Ypres. It's in the, the area of the Western Front, mainly held by uh, the French forces. This second map illustrates the main geographical features of the battle, particularly the Chemin de Dam Road, um, and the position of the French British trenches and the German front line. If we look at, and if you can see Crenel, um, that's, that's just about where the British forces were and the area to the east of Crenel, down to um, Hermonville, if you can see that, just to the southeast, um, to the west of Crenel, the area was held by the French army. It was mainly a French sector. And the British Ninth Corps came to this area in April, May to rest and recuperate. The battlefield uh, is contained, if you like, if we look at this here, uh, within the so-called mysterious triangle of Long to the north, Soissons um, to the west, and Reims to the east. To consider the kind of terrain of the battle, this particular German um, postcard illustrates, I think, the topography quite well, particularly the provenance of the Shamandadam Road and the ridge of the California Plateau uh, to the east, if we can see that known to the Germans as the Winterberg. And of course, the Winterberg Tunnel has been discovered in the last year or so. Um, notice in particular the deep uh, ravines cut into the southern slopes of what was a chalky, limestoney uh, terrain. And these southern slopes run down to the basin of the Ain River itself. Um, this final map shows the sector occupied by the British Ninth Corps. The British Ninth Corps was comprised of the 5th Division, the 8th Division, and the 21st Division in the front line. Um, to the rear, just to the rear and south of the Yen River, was the 25th Division in reserve. And the British Ninth Corps then was effectively sandwiched between the French sector. Um, to the west and the French sector to the east and south. Um, British troops then sat on the Shamandadam ridges and also if we cross the Ain River at Berio back on the map we get into much um, lower ground which stretches from Berio back to um, towards Reim, and it's more or less uniformly flat. 
where the Aisne River and Aisne Canal run. Okay, to put this into some kind of context in 1918, the third German offensive of 1918 then, opened on the 27th of May, after two relatively unsuccessful attempts to break the German line on the Somme and the Lys, the German general Ludendorff was forced to seek some other sector in which to commence the heavy assault of his spring offensive. He chose the thinly held front between Soissons and Reims, where for one of the few times in the war, a British army corps was under the direct command of the French. The front collapsed, allowing the Germans to rapidly advance, crossing the Aisne and reaching the Marne by the 30th of May. This was seen as one of the greatest one-day advances on the Western Front since the beginning of trench warfare, some 22 kilometres, nearly 13 miles. The Front was ruptured, but not entirely broken, and the Allied armies were forced to retreat. By the time the offensive eventually ground to a halt, on the 1st of June, the advance was about 28 miles. At Chateau Thierry, the German army was only 35 miles from Paris. One of the main sources of inspiration for my research on the end battle was The Last of the Ebb, a brief memoir by Sidney Rogerson. Rogerson was a staff captain in the 23rd Brigade and fought in the battle. This is what he said. It is but The Battle of the End was something different, just as it was more immediately successful from the enemy's point of view and more disastrous from the point of view of the French or British. At no other time was a British Army Corps so nearly annihilated, as was the Ninth Corps, between the Aisne and the Marne in May 1918. Fighting under French command, inadequately supported by artillery and practically without help from the air, the four tied divisions were forced to fight and run, fight and walk 27 miles in four days across wooded downlands and three fair rivers in brilliant summer weather and subsisting on a mixture of hard emergency rations and the good wine of champagne. It was an astonishing battle in a novel setting and it contained many notable feats of arms. It therefore should be better known. Sadly, even today, it's not really that well known. Rogerson's, Rogerson's experiences book the trend of many, many of his contemporaries and he remained far from disenchanted by his great war service. The attack outlined in Rogerson's book stands in stark contrast to the Western Front battles of 1916 and 17, where mud, blood and futility could be more readily applied. <clears throat> Five British divisions came to this haven of supposed tranquility on the end to rest and recuperate in late April 1918. All these divisions had played their role in the two previous German attacks on the Somme and the Lys and suffered very heavily for it. The end front was supposedly a refuge. Markham Brown, a former historian of the Imperial War Museum, who sadly died in the last few years, said in his introduction to The Last of the Ebb, what has happened to the mud, the squalor, the scream of shells, the rattle of bullets, the stink of gas, and all the standard paraphernalia of that ugly, brutal conflict? Why aren't men falling injured or dead every moment? Or if they aren't in action, why aren't they staring out glumly across a grim, menacing no man's land. If only this assessment provided by Brown was totally true. Sadly, shells were fired in profusion. Bullets certainly raked the parapets of the French and British soldiers hunkered down in deep dugouts on the opening day of the attack. And there was more than a whiff of gas in the air. And yet the Aisne attack was very different for the British soldiers who arrived from the Somme and the Ypres salient at the beginning of May 1918.
I intend now to consider some of the myths of this battle and other battles on the Western Front in terms of mud, blood and futility. Was it a muddy battle? As a boy growing up in the Northeast, I was often chided by my man as being up to the eyes in clouds. And certainly the lads of the 50th Northumbrian Division would have seen their fair share of mud during the preceding three years of conflict. But for them and members of the other bedraggled divisions who had decamped to the Inn region in the late spring of 1918, this was a journey to a safe haven removed from the desolate, shattered landscapes of mud that characterised Ypres and the Somme. An officer of the Durham Light Infantry, Infantry noted, in trenches shallowed by green trees in the Bois de Bon Marais, gay with flowers and singing birds, the war bore a different aspect. Here, surely, was that hitherto phantom sector all had some day hoped to find. Soldiers' letters and later memoirs of men who served in this quiet backwater contain glowing references to the flora and fauna of the region. Cindy Rogerson, again, conjured up a vision of a lost Ill, Ill regained. He said, gone was a depressing monotony of Flanders, drab and weeping, gone the battle-wrecked landscapes of Picardy and the Somme. He was all peace. The countryside basked contentedly in the blazing sunshine. Trim villages nestled in quiet hollows behind lazy streams and tired eyes were refreshed by the sight of rolling hills clad with great woods golden with laburnum blossom. By the soft greenery of lush meadowland, shrubby vineyards and fields of growing corn. In the shell holes, grass had grown and water plants. Near the gun emplacements in the reserve line grew lilies of the valley, forget-me-lots, larkspur and honeysuckle. The whole battle areas had become a shrubbery fashioned by artillery. Among the reeds of the Aisne River, I hunted the swallowtail, swallowtail butterflies and rare Campbell beauties, and even found a white throat's nest with eggs. Lieutenant A.S. Witherington, an artillery officer, also in the Northumbrian Division, was also particularly pleased with his new assignment. He said, and he echoed many of the sentiments expressed by Rogerson, the weather was fine and warm, the conditions were ideal. Compared with the drab mining district we had just left and the rather uninteresting mud flats of Flanders, we were now in as fine a countryside of hills and valleys, well wooded as one could wish to see. During the three weeks that followed, the results of the rest and change of scene manifested themselves very clearly. The men became bronzed, the horses and mules plump with coats soft and silky, and everybody was cheery. On most nights during our period in action, the whole countryside was lightened up by a clear moon and all was peaceful except for the croaking of hosts of frogs. On the eastern flank of the front line, the sector occupied by the 21st Division, um, being topographically similar to Flanders, being almost uniformly flat with the odd rise in terrain. But even here, soldiers like R.H. Keenan of the 8th Leicesters expressed sentiments akin to their comrades lodged on the heights of the Shemander Dam. Keenan, the atmosphere on this front is wonderful. The feel of the place is different from Ypres too. Up there, the unending rumble of guns. It seemed that it had always been like that and would be so forever. It was what we expected. The British front, frightfulness, dullness, rain, mud, dead bodies, stench, the whistle of stray bullets. Ypres was just what I expected of the war. But here it was all green and blue and bright. Everyone is interested in us. The French soldiers grin are friendly and ask us questions. There are lovely bottle green woods with dark streams in them. However, not everyone was lulled into a false sense of safety. Captain L.D. Spencer observed, all of which does not sound very much like war or tales of our brave fighting men, does it? Well, no, but... And just at present, this is a quiet bit of the line, but one always lives on the edge of a volcano 
and you never quite know when the eruption is going to start. The tranquility of the aim was also remarked upon by the enemy to the German forces, the Schmander Dam was known as the sanatorium of the Western Front, but it was the Germans who were to destroy this haven of tranquility. I would now like to consider this aspect of the battle in terms of bloodshed. Was it bloody? Before I assess the impact of the attack, it is important to consider the, the assiduous preparations made by the German army. It was due to this meticulous planning that the ensuing battle was not to be that bloody. On the 30th of April, 1918, General Ludendorff made the final decision to go ahead with the offensive on the end. The attack over the Shimano Dam was planned as a diversion to give the impression that Paris was the ultimate target. It was hoped that this would draw French troops from the north to cover the capital. And once this had been accomplished and the Northern Front weakened, a knockout blow would be delivered against the British, forcing them back to the Channel ports. The 7th German Army would be tasked with the taking of the ridge of the Shimandadam Plateau with subsidiary assistance provided by the 1st German Army on the flank of the attack, designed to push the enemy back over the, the Ain Marne Canal and take the higher ground, the ridges to the south. In early May, the 7th German Army commenced the preparations needed for a large scale surprise attack across a 35 mile front. The preparation for the offensive was diligent in the extreme. All movement was confined to the dark of night. Nature helped con contribute to the concealment. The area between Law and the front line was in places heavily forested. It was also a spring and the leaves were in full leaf. This region proved ideal in providing storage depots for the vast amounts of ammunition and other supplies that were required for the operation. The mating sounds of thousands of frogs in the Erlet Valley also helped to mask the sound of troops, supplies and ammunition being ushered forward. Brooke Muller, the architect of the German artillery plan, observed, the crocking of frogs in the airlet is so powerful that it drowns out the rattle of the ammunition columns. So the frogs are what you might call our latest allies. I dare say after this, the French will be saying that the Bosch had been bribing the frogs to do it. The wheels of all the vehicles on the move were also well greased and even fitted with leather cover coverings and every artillery piece with loose metal was wrapped in straw. Additionally, no vehicle on road or rail displayed a label or any other distinguishing feature. It was to be one of the great surprise attacks of the war. However, this is not to say the Allied forces did not get wind of the forthcoming offensive. Trench raids two days before had established that there was a possibility of an attack on this French. The French high command thought the Germans had allowed false reports to fall into their hands, take their minds of a German offensive being planned elsewhere. Also, the commander of the 6th French Army, General Duchesne, who hasn't come out of this particularly well, was prepared to defend the Chemin de Dame to the last. In many respects, the end front was like the like Verdun um, to the French or Ypres to the British. Too much blood had been spelt, spilt here to give up such a commanding position lightly. Won at tremendous cost the year before during the Nivelle Offensive. British divisional generals had protested to the 9th Corps commander, General Hamilton Gordon, about the precarious nature of their position with their backs to the River Aisne but it was for no avail. Duchem waved away these protests in a dismissive fashion. I would now like to talk about the artillery bombardment on the, 20, on the days leading up to and on the 27th of May itself. Artillery played the decisive role in the success of this attack, without a shadow of doubt. This was largely due to the innovative fire plan of the master technician, Georg Bruckmuller. The plan was notable for a series of firsts. 
5,263 guns would be used against the Allies, 1,422. This was the greatest superiority ratio achieved by the Germans in any of their battles during the course of the Great War. Secondly, one of the German innovations for this battle was that the guns and trench mortars used, used only gas shells for the first 10 minutes. This was designed to create panic and demoralize right from the start. The next phase of the barrage consisted of a bombardment of mixed gas and high explosive targeted at British and, British and French artillery positions, as well as mortar shelling of frontline defenses. In total, the artillery preparation lasted two hours and 45 minutes, two hours, 45 minutes. The shortest, but the most concentrated of any of the German attacks in 1918. The German artillery fired some 3 million shells on the 27th of May, 50% being gas, the highest proportion for any attack of the war. If we put this into context, there was certainly a ballistic revolution here. If you remember 1916, prior to the attack on the Somme, on the 1st of July, the week leading up, and on the 1st of July itself, somewhere in the region of uh, 1.6 million shells. By the 27th of May 1918, they managed to fire 3 million in two hours, 45 minutes. This illustrates the way in which artillery and it underlines the fact that this was the Great War, a gunner's war, above all else. Finally, the German preparations guaranteed almost total surprise on the morning of the attack. The German batteries opened up a continuous barrage from all their artillery uh, pieces at precisely 1 a.m. in what is generally regarded as the most intensive bombardment of the entire war. As such, it marked the best example of artillery neutralization. The ability to be able to shatter the enemy's will to resist and defeat them by an unexpected assault rather than waging a war of destruction against the enemy's defensive. Right, was it bloody then? The German artillery preparation went entirely to plan. Almost every single frontline trench, communication trench, fortified command position, and artillery battery was hit with HE and gas shells. Long range artillery targeted the tracks behind French railway guns. 14 had been captured in the German advance. Counter battery fire was particularly effective. Within 10 minutes of the attack, each artillery battery received attention from three German artillery positions. Major Horace Hazlitt of the 1st 4th East York's station on the, on the plateau of the Shimanda Dam observed. The bomb bomb was certainly considered the heaviest ever experienced by men who had been through previous shows. Inside 10 minutes of the commencement, communication was completely cut between Battalion HQ Brigade and between Battalion HQ and the companies in front. It was on the, con on the California plateau, the Winterberg, the highest point on the Shimanda Dam, that the bombardment was its, at its most intense. And the 1st 4th East Yorkshires and other battalions of the 150th Brigade, part of the 50th Division, were rapidly overwhelmed. The epicentre was the village of Crom, just south of the California Plateau. This was the key position of the Allied defence, and as a result, it came in for special artillery treatment. Just below the plateau, the 4th Yorkshire Regiment, was dug in in one of the ridges leading up to Crawl. The adjutant, uh, Lieutenant Victor Purcell, had a clear view when the German bombardment commenced. Precise as a sundown at noon, the bombardment started. It was as if a planet flying into 100,000 meteors were discharged to sunder the Earth's crust. The crest of the plateau, as far as the eye could reach, was lit up by bursting shells. Sandbags were flung far into the air, duckboards and reveting frames battered into a shapeless mess, and steel girders twisted and cast abroad like the pieces of a Charles Meccano set. The bombardment was intenser than he had ever known. There was certain to be a large force of infantry behind it, three or four divisions at least. Nevertheless, it was unlikely they would come 
over the plateau. It was too much of a commanding position to be taken by a frontal attack. A few machine guns would simply mow them down. The infantry assault then on the 27th of May, I'd like to consider next. 3.40 a.m. zero hour, the German infantry assault commenced. Major General A.D. Unruf observed, at close range, the trench mortars began to demolish the English wire entanglements and our stormtroops manned their assault positions. The battle, in fact, had begun before the enemy realised it. The element of surprise, most important factor in victory, had been preserved up to the last moment, and a feeling of relief passed through our lines. It was still 20 minutes before dawn, and much of the Shimanda Down was shrouded in, in an early morning mist. Visibility was further hampered by the accumulation of gas and smoke. This lack of vision undoubtedly helped the advancing troops to penetrate Allied frontline positions and further contribute to the element of surprise. 14 German infantry divisions took part in the initial attack against five French and three British divisions. The German infantry captured thousands of disoriented British and French soldiers still hunkering down in the deep dugouts of the Chemin Dam Plateau, many still wearing gas masks. 20, 20 officers alone were taken prisoner from the 1st, 4th East Yorks, along with hundreds of other ranks. This was re replicated along the front line of the attack as most forward positions fell within the space of two hours. Captain Yu Lyon of X Company, the 6th Dermalite Infantry, was in awe of the German methods on the first day of the attack. I had been reckoning with on the customary pause before an art artillery line can follow a barrage, but the German tactics here, well justified by success, were to place their advanced troops almost in the skirts of their barrage, thus giving the defence no time to recover. The intense bombardment, heavy beyond all previously endured, had split the line into small isolated groups of sadly shaken men who fell an easy prey to the first German line. A large number must have surrendered without resistance. The speed and method of advance, nowhere did I see the slightest confusion or hurry, filled us with a despairing admiration. I am certainly prepared to regard the preparation and the execution of the whole attack as one of the best things an army has ever done. Like many fellow officers of the 50th Division, you line would end up as a prisoner of war. At the beginning of the talk, I outlined the fact that the N has been seen as an early form of Blitzkrieg. The classic view, of course, of Blitzkrieg comes from the German army attacks of 1939 and 1940, and comprised a war of movement with artillery, sorry, a war of manoeuvre with artillery, mobile infantry, tanks and dive bombers, all working in unison to disrupt and overwhelm defending forces. The German army's attack on the end made excellent coordinated use of artillery and infantry. Aircraft and tanks were also deployed here as well, but without the same level of coordination and consequently with varying degrees of success, as we shall see. First of all, first of all I'd like to consider the role played by the German Air Force. <laughs> the German Air Force dominated the skies over the end on the first day of the battle operating out of airfields near Law, with two crack flying circuses attached to the German 7th Army. The first was particularly renowned, having been under the command of the Red, Brow, with the Red Baron until his death in April 1918. The end battle is also notable for the introduction of the Fokker D-7, uh, arguably Germany's best fighter plane of the war, renowned for their great strength, good manoeuvrability, and excellent performance at high altitude. The end result was the French and British air forces were virtually eliminated on the first day. As one of these um, fighter formations, the German air force also comprised 14 squadrons of Schlagstaufen, whose function was the strafing of targets in the path of the advancing stormtroopers. On the 27th of May, May 
These ground attack airplanes, flying as low as 150 feet, provided valuable support for the German infantry, infantry divisions and attacked the German, the retreating British and French troops on the roads behind the front. In addition, a squadron of German bombers attacked targets in the Allied rear. The marshalling yards were bombed, causing considerable damage to French supply lines. The German Air Force gained local superiority during the first four days. A British Air Force officer noted, this battle is interesting as it marks a distinct advance in the use made of German aircraft in ensuing a complete surprise. Certainly were enemy aircraft seen on the front prior to the battle. Very few photographic machines came over and no balloons were up on our front. Furthermore, his analysis is even more instructive in the comparison he makes of the role of the German Air Force in the March retreat and the April battle on the, on the lease. Formerly, the enemy did not seriously attack aerodromes and transport on the roads. But in, but in this battle, he made great efforts to do so, and all his attacks were carried out with determination. A vigorous air offensive was also maintained. The enemy's intention was obvious. It was to destroy every machine in the air, and I certainly felt that he was doing his utmost to obtain, to attain this object. In the March retreat, co cooperation between machines worked without much difficulty, and any air, enemy aircraft attacking were generally driven off with ease. Next, I want to consider um, the German tank attack. The Germans made use of a small number of tanks on the 27th of April, albeit with limited success. All these were British model Mark IVs, most of which had been taken to Cambrai in November 1917 during the successful counterattack. <laughs> the tanks were deployed between Cobbinet and Juvencourt, where the ground was fairly flat against the British 8th and 50th divisions on the front of about six miles. <clears throat> The terrain over which the captured tanks advanced was the same as the French tanks that assaulted the previous year during the opening phase of the Nivelle Offensive, with broadly similar results. 19 tanks were used by the Germans in four assault tank divisions. Only one of these detachments achieved some measure of success, helping reserve German Reserve Infantry Regiment 66 to capture the western part of the village of Berriobach. However, the threat was more apparent than real. Rainier Strassheim, in his book on Butte Panzer, or Butte, or sorry, trophy tanks, observed by the time the tanks had worked their way through the initial uh, enemy trench system, the assault infantry was off and gone. Three tanks were told to return to their assembly area. Following the advance, Wagon 117, commanded by Lieutenant Lippold got stuck in a swampy patch of terrain and incurred damage. After removing valuable parts, the vehicle was abandoned and Lippold and his crew fought on as an assault squad. <clears throat> the failure of the German attack on the 27th of May was due to a lack of numbers and because the tanks themselves were too slow and vulnerable. These deficiencies were made worse by the deployment. The vehicles are widely scattered over a front of about six miles, which lessened their impact considerably. I would now like to consider the attack on the British battle zone, the secondary line of defence. Despite the large number of prisoners taken, British troops, when given the opportunity to fight, fought bravely on the whole. The German advance at the end was held up by isolated groups of men, grimly attempting to hold back the surge of stormtroops. As most frontline positions were quickly overwhelmed, the British troops in the battle attempted to slow the advance. Confused fighting reigned in the Bois de Barmoret, where soldiers of the 7th and 8th DLI initially found easy targets for their machine guns. But soon the fighting descended into small scale engagements in that large wood. In, in that large wood that stretched back to the end. The reserve battalion, the 5th DLI, rushed to send the advance, but were beaten back to the river. Some mixed companies of men from both the 50th 
and the 8th Divisions desperately attempted to defend the bridges over the Aisne, but were often outflanked by the sheer weight of German infantry, who often appeared in the rear of their positions. Such was the rapidity of the German infantry attack that all three brigadiers of the 50th Division were caught up in the action that day. Brigadier Riddell of the 149th Brigade provided a vivid account of his experiences. At about 6 a.m., the headquarters of both the 151st and the 149th Brigades had become, in effect, the front line. Riddell left his quarters to consult with Brigadier Martin of the 151st Brigade. Shells were bursting all about us, and machine gun bullets flipped the leaves and smacked the trees. We could hear the Lewis guns of the 5th DLI rat-a-tatting away behind us. Martin and I ran on towards the 5th NF. We'd only gone, for, gone a few yards when a sh shell burst on our left. I felt a terrific blow in the face and saw Martin roll over. I went to him. He was quite dead. I walked on half days with a great hole in my face in which I could put my hand, but I did not feel much pain. Brigadier Rees of the 150th Brigade, the last brigade of the 50th Division, was also captured probably about the same time further to the west, trying to cross the end. Early the next morning, the 28th of May, he was driven by car to the California Plateau and granted an audience with His Imperial Majesty the Kaiser, who had come to witness the success of the offensive at first hand. Two famous last ditched stands were made by British troops of the 8th Division that day uh, also took place in the battle zone and need to be briefly mentioned. Both events were captured by British war artists. This painting by W.B. Wollen depicts the second Devons at the Bois de Boots, southwest of La Villa Bois on the morning of the attack. Here we can see um, Lieutenant Colonel Anderson Mooreshead bravely commanding his men in a, in a despairing attempt to repel superior numbers of German troops who had already broken through the trenches occupied by the battalion. This stand made by the Devon, Devons has become one of the most celebrated rear guard actions of the Great War and won them the Croix de Guard. Part of the citation reads, although surrounded and repeatedly attacked, the battalion successfully defeated all attempts of the enemy to advance on its front. There is no doubt that this battalion perished en masse. It refused to surrender and fought to the last. However, in many respects, the stand made by the Devons has been somewhat misrepresented, as further research has shown that substantial help was provided by the Second Middlesex and the Second West Yorks, and perhaps not quite all of the Devons perished in this attack. Um, a more mu nuanced account of this action is covered in my book. This slide shows the last hour of the Gibraltar battery. The other celebrated action that took place was also in the vicinity of the Bois de Butts, made by the 5th Gibraltar Field Battery. The memorial on the wall in the Marie in the village of La Villebois states, during the offensive of May 1918, the battery was attacked by an overwhelming force. The guns continued to fire and resistance did not cease until every man was killed or captured. For this action, the battery was awarded the Croix de Guerre as well. Terence Cuneo's graphic painting captures the violence and bravery of the gunners in their desperate attempt to hurl back the overwhelming tide of German stormtroopers assaulting their gun positions. The battery commander and two subalterns rallied the surviving men and with Lewis guns and rifles attempted to beat off the attack. As for the Devons, despite the fact that resistance was undoubtedly heroic, many men became prisoners of war. <clears throat> By 9.30 a.m., the enemy had broken through to the end. Very few bridges had been destroyed, allowing the German infantry to penetrate to the south. The battle now became one of pursuit in the open country between the Aisne and the Marne. 
British reserves in the 25th Division attempted to staunch the, fl- staunch the flow of, enemy, of the enemy troops. Troop formations had been broken and remnants of all units uh, retreated into the open country beyond the battle zone. This type of fighting with hastily organised rearguard actions was to characterise the next phase of the battle, which was to last until early June. In the space then of five days from the 27th of May until the 1st of June, the German army advanced 28 miles. At Chateau Thierry on the Marne, they were only 35 miles from Paris. To answer the question posed at the beginning of this section, was it bloody? Well, the Ninth Corps lost close to 30,000 men. 1,298 officers and 27,240 other ranks. Most of the battalions ceased to exist as fighting units. Sidney Rogerson again. This was the most disastrous battle on the Western Front for the troops engaged. In no other did formation suffer such destruction. But despite the alarming losses of men, it was not bloody. In that, relatively speaking, few men were killed. The vast majority were taken prisoner. Unquestionably, a substantial number of soldiers who were wounded on the 27th of May were also made POWs. In fact, casualty clearing stations and also an army field hospital found themselves enveloped by advancing enemy troops. A German monograph, too, quoted the official history, states that 60,000 Allied prisoners were taken during the battle. A large proportion of these on on that first devastating day of combat. So was it futile? So does the fighting of the Shaman Dam conform to the myth that it was one of futility and that the men who fought here were disenchanted with their experience? In, t- in terms of the received wisdom of warfare on the Western Front as being static and attritional, the fighting on the end was clearly different. A breakthrough was achieved on the first day and in subsequent days combat took place in the open countryside of the Marne. Did the men view the fighting here as futile? And was there a growing disenchantment with their lot? This is definitely not the case if we examine uh, the many memoirs, diaries and letters of the combatants. At the top of the talk, I outlined the relief felt by many men who had come to the safe haven of the Aisne in the early summer of 1918. Even when combat commenced, a tone of optimism prevailed despite the overwhelming bombardment and the rapid advance of German forces. Fighting was now in the open, and the scattering of battalions ushered in more of a soldier's battle. For many British and French soldiers, their war was over in a matter of minutes, once the German infantry, in effect, arrested thousands of troops, still deep in their dugouts, dazed, confused and gassed. There would have been broad agreement with the sentiments expressed by Captain M.S. Esk of the 2nd Middlesex. My thought was, that is the end of the war for me. I am alive and shall not be shot at any more. By late afternoon on the first day of the battle, the battlefield had opened up and had become increasingly fluid. The German army was over the end in several places and the British and French were in headlong retreat. There were a number of occasions when positions were outflanked and reports of units marching into villages that had already fallen to the enemy. On the whole, though, the withdrawal of the British army on the 27th of May and the days that followed was a common sense retreat uh, deep into the heart of the Champagne countryside. However, soldiers had become completely detached from their units and intermingled with troops from different divisions. Others found themselves fighting alongside the French. For many soldiers, this style of fighting afforded uh, a greater sense of freedom and independence away from the constraints of authority. Private William Hall in the East Lancashire Regiment found himself almost completely isolated. Here, I was experiencing greater adventure than I had ever had in my wildest dreams, and this roving without molestation was truly the happiest adventure I had ever had. I could wander along to my heart's uh, delight and wish for no happier life 
My Prius must have presented a real Robinson Crusoe effect. Without tunic shirt and wearing a French officer's hat and a bundle tied to the end of my rifle, which was slung over my shoulder, I must have like, looked like the sole survivor. Another survivor who was far from disenchanted was Second Lieutenant John Nettleton of the Rifle Brigade. Sections of his memoir, The Anger of the Guns, read like a postcard from a recent holiday. I cannot remember much about the next few weeks, but it was the most idyllic of the war. The 8th Division had ceased to exist as a division. There was no organisation and no orders. When you found men straggling about, you attached them to your little group and just wandered about the countryside, sitting on the top of a hill until you were pushed off it and then wandered back to the next one. The weather was lovely and there was little shelling. At night, we dug ourselves small trenches and lined them with branches and leaves and lay in great comfort. We even tried a bit of looting, but the French refugee does not leave much behind, even when he is fleeing from an invader. After about three weeks of this delightful existence, the Bosch advance ran out of steam. The situation was stabilised and the army caught up with us. The final word should be left to the redoubtable Sidney Rogerson, who had to swim across the Aisne to avoid capture. For all this violence and a sustained intensive action, the battle was a reversion to a cleaner and more wholesome style of warfare. It was fought in fine weather and in lovely country, and larger with mobile weapons such as rifles and machine guns, instead of in crabbed trench systems where men, legs shackled by clinging mud, were battered into the filth and ooze by high explosives. When two months later, King George V conferred the Victoria Cross on General Grogan for his gall gallantry in action, I decorated my note of congratulation with a little sketch of him on the Treslon Ridge. In his reply, which I still treasure, he said he would keep my letter as a personal remembrance of the very strenuous and I hope cheery times which we passed together on the air in the Marne. That seemed to describe that fortnight more accurately than might be imagined. The following slides illustrate this open nature then of the fighting. Men here are in extended order, just over the end, um, waiting for the German troops to attack. Here you can see French and uh, British soldiers, probably of the 50th Northumberland Division, um, intermingling at a place called Savigny sur Ard, again, um, between the, um, the Aisne and the Marne on the, the day after, the 28th of May. This intermingling can also be seen here as this poilu of Scots, uh, a British soldier um, wandering along the roads in, in the beautiful countryside of the end in, um, it would appear uh, to be quite good weather conditions. Right, I'd like to um, end this talk on um, the Battle of the End and talk about whether I consider that the battle was, as I outlined at the beginning, the essence of Blood Creek. Well, certainly a new benchmark for tactical surprise was set in the end in May 1918. The innovative measures carried out prior to the attack across the Shimanda Dam, which enabled an attacking force of more than 30 divisions and over a thousand artillery batteries to remain virtually undetected was astonishing. Rogerson, yet again, in the last section of his book entitled The Reckoning, provided this analysis. It was the enemy's last great offensive, the most brilliant and the most successful. Not only better planned than his others, but the secret of his preparations better kept. The first breakthrough was so overwhelming, so complete, that nothing he did before or after could be compared to it. General, Major General Hubert Asim, who had been adjutant of the 2nd Northamptonshire Regiment, wounded in April, otherwise he would have probably been there with his battalion, noted in his military history, the Battle for Europe 1918, the technique of complete surprise was now to be demonstrated in its highest perfection by the Germans on the end, and was to set a pattern for the most of the coming offensives of the war and to continue to be employed in World War II on the Russian front, 
and finally with remarkable initial success in the Ardennes in December 1944. I would like to compare then the AIN offensive with one of the, the most celebrated actions of the BF in 1918, the attack launched at Amiens on the 8th of August. That year, the British Army advanced eight miles and took 18,000 prisoners to Ludendorff. This represented the black day of the German army in the war. This all arms attack with artillery, infantry, tanks and aircraft all working together harmoniously is being heralded as the birth of modern warfare. And the momentum of the BEF's attack was, in due, was due in part to its mobile arm, the use of whippet tanks and two cavalry divisions. The Germans on the AIM, on the other hand, achieved significantly better results, advancing 15 miles, opening up a 25 mile wide salient, taking around 25,000 prisoners, all on the 27th of May, with a few cavalry and a minimum number of tanks. The tempo of this attack had been maintained by attacking infantry who were trained to use their initiative to exploit any gaps in the enemy's defences. Such a virtual sort of display of tactical nous caused General Essene to remark in his conclusion, here, 20 years before it became a household word, in spirit at any rate, was the essence of Blitzkrieg. Which I don't totally buy. It was not Blitzkrieg per se. First and foremost, strategy was made on the hoof by the German Army Command after the success of the first day. The key to the success of the German army across the Schumann Dam and then the Aisne had been meticulous planning. This was not the case on subsequent days. The momentum of the offensive was bound to slow down. The prevailing road, rail and river networks in this part of France all ran east west, which cut against the grain of the German attack as it was to run broadly, as it was to run broadly on the north-south axis. We can see it here represented on the map. After the first day, there were a number of conflicting objectives for the offensive. Ludendorff had planned the attack as a diversion, but with the tactical gains accrued after the 27th of May, this course of action changed. The German offensive lacked coherence and focus. There was a push to the southwest to threaten Paris. Other units were driving towards the Marne, almost due south, with others forced into an attempt to take Reims, the hub of a major railway network, which they never achieved. This dis dissipated effort in an operational sense. And even though with more territory taken in the sub subsequent days, still no overriding strategic objective emerged. To embark upon such an ambitious project, hoping that suitable opportunities would present themselves that could be exploited, depended on a logistical support system that the German army sadly lacked. A large American supply base had been overrun and other French depots seized. The ammunition taken could not be issued to troops at the front because of a lack of transport. As the German army pushed on, they had to rely exclusively on horses, and these were dwindling in number by 1918. There was no mechanised columns to provide support and supply became a serious problem once the distance between uh, the railhead and the front line was 40 miles or more. The momentum of the attack then was bound to grind to a halt, given the exhausted nature of the German frontline troops. By the 1st of June, some 15 divisions had been fighting for the best part of a week, and 12 of 14 reserve divisions had also been used. General A.D. Unruh provided a commentary on the German side of the offensive in Rogerson's Last of the End, gave us a su succinct summary of why the last German, the last major German attack of 1918 ran out of steam. That is difficult to argue against. Ammunition was running short and the problem supply in view of the large demands became more difficult. It became all too clear that action so stubbornly, stubbornly contested and involving us in such formidable losses would never enable us to capture Paris. In truth, the brilliant offensive had paid it out. And so has this talk. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, David. 
Um, can I ask everyone to give the usual um, raising your hands by way of a silent round of appreciation, please? Uh, we've already had a couple of questions coming in, David. Uh, I'll bring the speakers up. Alan, do you want to? Uh... Um, yeah, it was an excellent talk there. Thanks. Um, thanks very much for that. I much appreciate it, mainly because I have a something of a personal interest here. My grandfather, also Alan Atkinson, was part of 105 Field Company Royal Engineers. They were at, uh, I think, Brigade Headquarters down at John Terry. And the day before, on the 26th of May 18, they were actually away, a few miles away, building a rifle range, which, if nothing else, indicates that one, they weren't expecting an attack, and two, they weren't expecting to lose the ground on which they were working. Um, they hadn't been back to the base in John Tree very long that that evening before they were uh, they were basically told that they were going to a place called Muscourt or rather Muscourt and Murival, which is about eight miles away from John Tree. They marched through the night, arriving about four thirty in the morning. War diary. There are two. There are two versions in the war diary, which are one more detailed than the other, but fairly consistent indicating that there were a lot of gas shells coming over that night. Um, initially, when they got to Moscow, they were, um, a couple of officers were, were, were sort of instructed to go and blow some bridges across the Aisne. But that order quickly got countermanded because the Germans were already over the Aisne. Yeah. So what, ha what happened then is that the, the field company engineers, along with remnants of some French who were retreating in some number, plus the remnants of the loyal North Lanx, whose commanding officer had been killed, basically got involved in a rear guard action, but, but unsuccessfully, and they eventually sort of retreated. I think they lost about half their, around about half their strength, either, either killed, wounded, killed, wounded, or captured that day. Um, basically, was, uh... the section was commanded, well, the section was were, were involved, four second lieutenants, one of which is my grandfather and another one who were captured. So if nothing else, that indicates that whatever intelligence there was previously as to the time, speed and, and size of the German attack, it obviously didn't get through to the engineers who'd been busy building a rifle range the previous day. Well, well it was a complete surprise. I mean, Moscow as were one of uh, two, was it two VCs and one? by the Lancashire Regiment, and I've forgotten his name now. I <laughs> can't remember, but it was Muscle oh, that um, one of the VCs was one that day. Okay. Um, but have you been um, in uh, email contact with me at all? Because I'd like to... Um, um, in a word, no, I haven't. But if, if I can get hold of your email address at some stage, um, I'll, I'll send you an email. Do you have any letters from your um, relative who took part? Or? Um, I've got, I've got some postcards post capture. What I have got um, is, I think it's called a form 2A. Officers captured were required once they were repatriated after the war to fill in the statement of their capture. Of the two second lieutenants captured that day, I cannot find any, any I cannot find a file for the other one, but I have, I have a copy amongst other things. I have a copy of my grandfather's uh, Form 2A, which is his own personal account, but generally consistent with what the War Diary says. You should mention that because um, there was a couple in Kent who I've lost contact with now, and this is, I've gone back probably 10 years ago. They went to the National Archives on a regular basis, and I have probably somewhere in the region of 200 statements. Of <laughs> they, they not only found them, but they also typed them up yeah. of their capture statements. They had some issue with um, the Devons um, being overrepresented in their rear guard action, and they wanted to rectify the record of the second Middlesex in the Bois de Bud. Mm -hmm. So they went on this kind of uh, this attempt to look at the whole battle and to find as many capture states as possible. I've got 200 of them at least. Yeah. I don't know where I've got that many from some of the uh, 
the other units in the in the rear. Anyway, to, to, let, to let the other to let the other the other people have a have have a say. I've been going on long enough. If if we can exchange email addresses, I'll be in contact some other time. Right, that'd be great. I'm on uh, Twitter, and you can probably find me there if you're on a top. Oh, I don't do Twitter, but um, either from either from Simon or yourself, I'll get hold of yeah, Simon. Simon will probably find. Yeah, send, send it by me, Alan. I'll make yeah. sure it goes to David. Okay. Bye then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, thanks. okay. Thanks then. Okay. Bye bye then. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Malcolm. Next Malcolm, to... is it? Yeah. Hello, uh, David. Thank you very much for um, your very interesting talk. Uh, like Alan, the last one, I've got uh, a personal interest in the... I know, I know Alan, I remember. I remember uh, the with my grandfather, who was, yeah. uh, who was there recuper well, recuperating after being um, going through the lease and the spring offensive, and he was with a 286 Siege Battery Royal Garrison Artillery. And a photograph features in your excellent book, uh, A in 1918, um, of him on the retreat road with his battery, um, which was, Martin, was, was, it, was anyway, it Toy? Was he? Was he? Yeah, Joseph, no, no, no. Joseph Arthur Toy. I think he featured yeah. on page one thirty-eight or something like that of your book. And uh, but my question was, I read somewhere, David, that. The daily uh, casualty rate in Third Aid was the highest of the Great War. Um, fortunately, it only lasted sort of was it in total ten days, um, and I just wonder whether that was in fact you think that's true because it's I know there's a lot of prisoners of war which of course I think that, I mean I think. They would have been probably um, incorporated into those lists, and indeed were the wounded. So I think it, it probably. I mean, a lot of units failed to, you know, re-emerge after that battle, and I think the vast majority of the men, as I'm, as I'm, you know, outlined it in most of the talk, were probably taken prisoner. I mean, my great uncle and my grandfather being but two examples of that. Certainly, were thousands taken prisoner on that first, so, which is good. I mean, that's why I'm here. <laughs> if that, well, sure. if, if that, if that <laughs> attack had been one of you know, which had became brought down in a tristle, the chances are I probably wouldn't be here. So, I'm actually quite pleased that the German attack was so successful because that allowed my uh, grandfather to um, to escape, I suppose, and become a prisoner of war. Ironically, it's quite so, remarkable. Yeah. Sorry. It's quite remarkable. So there were massive, massive inflated casualties due to, you know, massive numbers of men being captured. I mean, 20 to 25 officers in some uh, battalions were taken prisoner. That's phenomenal, phenomenal yeah. numbers. And then after that, we have the men. So we talked about, you know, in some, some of these battalions, probably, you know, 200, 300, 400 men were taken prisoner, particularly in the frontline battalions of... Um, uh, the 50th Division and the 8th Division. I mean, this thing about the Devons, which I could go on about, I mean, they said that, you know, it was almost like, you know, Leonidas and, and, and Thermopylae, they fought to, to the last man, which was true. If you look at the number of prisoners, um, you, you know, there was at least 20 officers in the Devons alone taking, taking prisoner that day, and then countless numbers of, of ordinary ranks as well. So... You know, you get this mis these misleading reports about what actually happened. But you know, there we are. My uh, my grandfather was in a position in the Bois de Marais with the two eighty six, and their sister battery, uh, the one hundred and twelfth, uh, lost every officer and other ranks. And so under the, the guns as well, I presume. Well, well, no, the... he would. If you remember, he yeah. was riding on yeah. one. <laughs> Which they yeah, managed to get out. Yeah. But the uh, the only thing he suffered from in the entire Great War was about a gout. <laughs> so that's right. why I find that always amusing. <laughs> but there we are. Thank you very much again, David, for your no help problem, and research no on that. Because uh, I, I I did a PowerPoint video presentation, which is on YouTube, which uh, and I did do credit you at the end of that. That's all right. That's, that's the that's information right. that you gave me. Right. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, nice. Malcolm.
Pleasure. Well, Gordon, nice to see you. Do you want to unmute? And... Hello, Simon. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, David, fantastic. I enjoyed, enjoyed it enormously. It's an area I've never really looked at um, for that period of time. Um, my feelings on it were, would you say that the British forces in the AIN area um, appear to have a, adopted a skirmishing tactic um, to, to sort of harry and delay the Germans, which um, with individual officers ma making their own attack and, attack and defense plans as the situation demanded? Or was I'll it like coordinated this. from... Like uh, was it coordinated from HQ? Well, I'd like to say yes, but... Probably not. I mean, most of these men who fought in the end battle were young, young men, famous, you know, 18 and 19, 18. I mean, if you look at that, if you go back to that, to that uh, list of officers with the role of um, the 5th Northumberland Fusiliers, we have 24 officers there who had been replaced. Right. The, you know, they would not have been able, I would imagine, in a, in a few days to kind of rally and instill in the men, a lot of whom had been urgently dispatched to um, to the end region. They were there to train, to rest and recuperate. A lot of them, that was their first action. So whether they were cap capable in subsequent days of fire and movement tactics, I'm not so sure they would have been that formidable, to be right. honest. Right, so it was just how it, how it panned out. It's almost going back to the Napoleonic Wars with the French, where they were moving and all in open land and, 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 and attacking and running it, hit and run and, uh, and well, sort of defending themselves. I think that's all, all they were capable of at that particular juncture. Yeah. Um, because the Germans were, you know, they were, they were pushing on relentlessly until they eventually outran their supply hat. Head. Yeah. And as I, I mentioned in the last bit, you know, they were 40 miles from the railhead and they were using, you know, mainly horses and there were very few of those by 1918. So logistically, the German attack ran out of steam. I don't think, that, I mean, I think the men did fight well at times and certainly yeah. they were organised particularly effectively in some of the battalions. I mean, some of them were regulars and the remnants of the regulars, but there were a lot of men who were not part of that. They were, you know, men who had been drafted in in 1918. Um, I mean, both my grandfather and my great-uncle were not part of that. Um, my great-uncle in particular had been through a number of battalions from about 1916 onwards of the Northumberland Fusiliers. But I, again, I don't think he'd been in the 5th North, Northumberland Fusiliers for many days before the 27th of May. So again, unit identity, the cohesion, I wouldn't have thought was great by that particular time of the war. They seem to have been particularly well officered at the time. And, uh, you know, they did a, the officers appear to have done a great job. And did the Germans suffer much? Did they, did they lose a lot? Um, again, I don't think they did because I think they were, you know, particularly successful in that particular type of attack. It was suppressive fire. Um, I don't think the casualties in that attack were massive, not in the way they were probably were earlier in, in some of the counterattacks, probably in, in Passchendaele in 1917, or even in um, the Somme um, in March. Um, I don't think they lost a massive amount of men um, on the attack on the 27th of May. In subsequent days, probably as some of the, you know, some of the French particular troops, you know, the defence was rallied. It wasn't a static battle, though. It was very fluid, wasn't it? People were moving about to concentrate artillery fire on moving people would be quite difficult, I should think. Well, I would, I would think, yeah, it was, yeah, it was definitely, it was, it, you know, defies, you know, the, the popular, popular view of attritional warfare, which had characterised most of the war, particularly through the big battles of 19th, you know, 1916, 1917. Okay, well, thanks for that. Excellent. I'll give you some sort of answer there. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. We've got Patrick now. Hello, David, and thank you for an excellent talk. This was very interesting. Uh, uh, my, my question was regarding uh, 
the offensive as a whole has usually been characterized as a tactical and strategic masterstroke by Ludendorff. But at the same time, the, it's also usually said that the Germans suffered from constantly changing objectives, no real solid targets except for the one the immediate ones just behind the front lines, and no real contingency plans, which tends to be somewhat contradictory. I mean, either it's a masterstroke or not, but uh, how would you characterize uh, the, oh. the... Well, what I would... What I would recommend, and if I was uh, really looking at this this again, I mean, I did an M Phil on this, mm. 2005, um, and I was talking about this, some of these concepts that you've just mentioned about the Battle of 1918 last week on Twitter, when I was talking um, to Robert Foley. And you can find um, one of his purpose, um, mm. it's not too different, called Breaking Through, the German concept of battle in 1918. And basically, he kind of talks about the fact that, you know, many people suggest that Ludendorff didn't have any um, real kind of strategic objectives. Mm. But what he said in, I mean, I can't, I can't really pressy that this particular um this particular paper, it's about, what is it, about 15, 16 pages, no, 21 pages. And I, found it. I, I found it here. <laughs> Sorry. L long live the internet. And basically, he's, he's saying that that was not what, what Ludendorff was up to. Um, huh? He was continuing. It's difficult for me to give a, a kind of brief overview, but hmm. basically, the German army was not fighting in the same way as the British and the French, where we... By 1918, they were, that was that kind of methodical step-by-step -step approach, bite and hold tactics. The Germans never had that concept of warfare. They were still using a concept of warfare that predates 1914. And basically, it was a battle of manoeuvre whereby they were looking to turn flanks and then use a turn flank to then inform where their next step would be leading to a battle of annihilation. So what Lundorf was actually trying to carry out was almost a pre-war planning manoeuvre. And by 1918, it was obvious that it was not going to work that effectively because logistically, the German army was running out of steam. Um, but his con Ludendorff's basic concept of battle in 1918 never involved him trying to find a particular strategic locale to take, be it, you know, the railway hub of Reims or Soissons or wherever. Do you see what I mean? So it was a different concept of battle that the Germans were carrying out. So if I was to reinvestigate this in a more academic sense, then I would certainly buy into what Robert Foley has to say about the German concept of battle uh, more. Because it's, it's, a, it's easy to criticise Lindorf in not having a strategic objective. Um, but then again, perhaps his concept was, was never about having a strategic objective. We, he was looking for this kind of means by which he carry out a battle of annihilation by turning flanks of the enemy, if you see what I mean. Anyway, that's what I've got to say no, about no, this. That, 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 was, that was an excellent answer. Thank you, Berg, because I think it might it may very well be that we're Colored by the, how should we say, the, the English and French concepts of battle and say, uh, judging others by those standards. And, and that's, not, that's not to say I'm a Germanist who kind of, un, you know, unfailingly accepts that the German b battle plan was, was, you know, fantastic in 1918. It certainly was not in terms of, you know, the, they were hamstrung, obviously, by the logistical support system, which was never going to provide the answers in 1918. Particularly, that it was re relying on horsepower. The British was the British and the French divisions, even in 1918, even in the middle of 1918, were, were much, much more mechanized than uh, the German army was. I mean, the German army was, was still using vast numbers of horses in 19, you know, 1940, 1941, for God's mm. sake. Thank you so Hello. much. That, that was very Hi. helpful. Thanks a lot, Thank Patrick. You. Thank you very much.
Um, that's the end of the questions, I think. Uh, we've had no more come in. Um, so once again, I'd just like to thank David oh, for thank a very interesting you. talk. You can relax Thanks, now, David. David. <laughs> well, as I mentioned to you before, in some of the talks we had prior to this, I mean, something I've had to really learn again because the last time I really talked about the end battle was probably in, you know, the, the anniversary of the battle in 2018, and my focus has been on Telverwood, but more recently on, you know, medical, uh, the, the, uh, the medical changes carried out in the Ypres between 1914 and 1918, which I've been heavily involved in researching in the last few um, few months. Well, we'll so I've had to relearn quite a brief we'll focus again on the end battle. <laughs> we look forward to talk on that in uh, in due course. It's going, take, it's going to take a while. I'm going to have to go to the, the National right. Archives and various other yeah. places to uh, hunt down, you know, more kind of original source material. Yeah. Can I anyway, just thank you, thank you once again, David? People are raising their hands right. uh, just by way of a thank you for that. But thank you again, David. And thank uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you in a couple Bye, of weeks. Everyone. Bye now. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Mademoiselle from Armitage, Parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, Parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, she hasn't been kissed for 40 years. Hicky, pinky, Parlez-vous. Out of